are not. That's a two and a half ton truck. Different kind of body, different shape. It's called the duck for amphibious operation. Ever try floating a truck across water? It needs a whole platoon of men. A big tarpaulin tucked up over the sides and she's floated across. That is, if there's no wind or waves. But America's fighting a modern war. So it takes the same GI truck, adds a little American ingenuity, and you got the duck. It's still a two and a half, but it's also a, a motorboat with its propeller, rudder, anchor, bilge pumps, watertight and waterproof, able to cut through almost any kind of surf but a good six knots. It's become more and more apparent that our strategy from now on in calls for, for landings on lots of beaches and in lots of places. Invasion from the sea. And there's been an urgent need for quicker, safer, more efficient ship-to-shore transportation. American production skill has sent the GI truck to sea, out to the big transports that lie offshore, with cargo for the men on land. With ducks to do the job of getting it ashore, it gets done in a hurry. Just as if the transports had been brought up onto the beach and unloaded there. This path from ship to shore was made on the American assembly line. A streamlined hull, of the watertight bearings, the quick conversion from water operation to land travel. When the duck is used, it reduces the hazard of exposed and dangerous beachheads, vulnerable from the air. At speeds up to 50 on the straightaway, the new amphibious two and a half can haul its freight quickly in them to concealment and security. It means invasion made easier and safer. The ducks in full production now back in the war plants at home, and every day more of them show up around the world. Already they've tasted combat in the South Pacific, in North Africa, in Sicily, and thousands more are on the way. Invasion's the order of the day, and American skill is right there to meet its requirements. Russian people, somebody has said, who shall ever know them? Well, we, their allies, shall know them as we move together against the common enemy. Here at the far edge of the fighting front comes a piano on a truck and a famous pianist to play for the flyers, as if they were home in Moscow, Leningrad, Vladivostok, or Stalingrad. of the war are fulfilled, but the concert goes on. And to the tank men comes a Russian singer to lift the spirits of the men with a song of home and love. Thank you. 
time to go now. The first, a bouquet traded for a good long hug and kiss, even as you and I. Who shall know the Russian people? The enemy shall know them, and know them all too well. Global war has strung a lot of uniforms around the world. Back home, the big cities are getting more and more used to foreign chevrons, cockeyed accents, allied servicemen coming from somewhere, going somewhere. Here for a day or two, or maybe three. Here's one of them, an Australian flyer, Wing Commander Keith Hampshire, RAAF, on his way to England with four days in New York en route. And while he's here, it's sea as much as possible. Today, the Empire State Building, the highest building in the world, 100 floors above New York, over 1,000 feet up above the second largest city in the world, even for an airman, that's altitude. And for anyone, it's an impressive sight. There are more than 10 million people down there, Commander. It's about as many people as in all Australia. It's New York, Hoboken and Jersey City, Brooklyn and Long Island City, Yonkers, Staten Island, Hackensack, Queens. It's New York. A lot of flyers, soldiers, sailors, and Marines come from here. That's Eddie Connor and Duke Duclo, his pals. Just back here after 20 months in the South Pacific. Hey, see that guy there in a blue uniform? Haven't we seen him somewhere before? Australia. Yeah, he was with us in New Guinea. That Boston outfit, I blame. You sure? Go over and ask him. No, you go. Oh, let's both go. Okay. They all got decorated in the Bismarck Sea Show in New Guinea, in the same spot where the commander did his flying. DFCs and Silver Stars for them, and. A DSO for Commander Hampshire. They're 7,000 miles away now, and when guys have flown together, they always head for the nearest bar to talk about it over a beer. No, actually, I've only been in this country two weeks. One day in New York, so far. Well, how do you like it? Great. Something like I'd hoped for. People are very friendly. Of course, I expected that, having seen so many of your chaps down in New Guinea. Uh, Commander, weren't you in that Australian squadron of Boston's uh, located at four miles? Right, 20 squadron. We were B-25s based on Schwimmer Field. Yeah, we were the first B-25 squadron into actual combat. Uh, Commander, you knew the generals, didn't you? Yes, yeah, a bit. Well, what was the brass hat version of this Bismarck Sea story? I mean, uh, how did they talk about it? You see, all we got was the fun and the convoy. Well, to summarize briefly, it's a great piece of work on the part of the intelligence, a well-conceived and rehearsed plan, and brilliantly executed. Well, you know that, naturally, you were there. One of the most pleasing features concerning the victory was that every unit of the 5th Air Force took part in the action and had some measure of success. Operations at every field completely understood the plan to the fraction of a minute. I knew when we got up that morning that it was going to be a big day. March the 3rd, 1943. As it turned out, it was the biggest day of my life. Three days, we'd had the ships all gassed up and loaded with eggs for Hirohito. The wedding had been tough. All we'd been worrying about was when. And that morning, when we hopped into our little B-25s, we were ready to go. Our squadron went up at about 9.30, all B-25s. The P-38 outfit went up with us. And on the timetable, the squadrons from almost all the other fields were going up at about the same time. Other B-25, Boston's, Bowfighters, P-38s, P-40s, B-17s, the works. Part of them Aussie, part of them Aussie and Yank. Most of them just Yanks. As we circled over Moresby, it was a beautiful day. Somebody told me the Japs had been counting on bum weather to get them through safely. But the weather certainly went off and left them that day. It was as clear as a bell, with a few cumulus clouds at about 5,000 feet. It took us a little more than an hour to get out there to that poor little old beat up convoy. They were doomed and they knew it. The whole damn 5th Air Force, almost, was hammering at them.
strafing him to knock out that ACAC. Aussies and the bullfighters went in first. And then we and the B-25s went in at mass height, skipping the bombs off the water to hit them broadside. Our squadron was for medium level bombing at 5,000 feet. Our bombardier got a direct hit and several near misses, which are sometimes better than a direct hit. That transport went down with all hands in about two and a half minutes. We wanted to stick around and go after some more, but once we'd shot our load and sunk a transport, we let out for home. The skip bombing boys made several runs, but we weren't that lucky. Anyhow, looking back, it was the prettiest sight I've ever seen. Japs, dead Japs, all over the damned ocean. In one day of bombing, actually, an entire Japanese division of more than 15,000 men and their equipment was destroyed utterly. 22 ships and 100 odd zeros as against four planes and 12 men. It was a bloody fine show. When our planes got back to their fields, squadron by squadron, they could lay a just claim to have saved the lives of thousands of Allied ground forces. Among others, Lord Trenchard, founder of the Royal Air Force, cabled us saying, the Americans and the Australians in the 5th Air Force have, as a result of the Bismarck Sea Battle, brought about the greatest air victory over sea power of all time in any theatre and in any war. <laughs> still some streets and old mobile that make you think of what it must have been a hundred years ago when the upriver planters came to town to race their horses and buy their drinking liquor. They say there wasn't a prettier town along the Gulf, but old mobiles changed. Mobile is a war town. More people than the city ever saw or dreamed about before are coming in. When there isn't room for them in town, they shack up along the creek banks, in empty lots, in stores, in trailers, in any place where there's room to pitch a tent or cook a meal or swing a cat. 150,000 people came down to Old Mobile, more than it takes to make an army. Many are wives and girls of men in uniform, and they bunk up in warehouses, making the best kind of a home they can. When the mail comes here, there are letters from Guadalcanal and Tunis and the Aleutians. Because now it's the shipyards of Old Mobile that people come to see. And the workers raise a pile of dust, swing shift and graveyard shift, crowding up the factory gates three times a day. This is why they come to Mobile, come down the river and over the dirt roads to the shipyard, come from the back hills from the quiet town leaving big houses and swamp shacks and kitchens for the shipyard. Uncle Sam called for war workers, and they're still coming. It doesn't matter much whether it's skill work, precision work, or work that takes just nerves. The women have stepped right in to take the place of their men, welding and riveting. More than fried chicken and spoon bread are what the war south is getting to be famous for. The kids don't always understand where their fathers have gone. You can tell them, but they don't always understand. But they have a good time getting used to a new place, playing with strange kids. And all the time, down at the wharves, once a week, as regularly as the bells of Christ Church ring on Sunday, a new ship gets her wine as the blocks come out and she goes down the Mobile Bay. Goes down the bay, down the Gulf. Out to where the shooting war begins.
another day. Nuts! If I could only get out and drill. Precisely why I am here. I'm Goldie the Gold Brick. Be like me. Use your head. With a heart of pure gold and a backside of lead. When there's cold and there's rain and you don't want to train, you gold brick, just gold brick, just gold brick. Just pretend that you're sick and your poor back is sore and limp with a groan to the hospital door. While your pals train in rain, you can lay back and snore. If you gold brick, just gold brick, just gold brick. When you're digging a slip trench that ought to be deep, and the going's so tough that you go down near weep, just dig a few inches and crawl in and sleep. And gold brick, just gold brick, just gold brick. When there's work to be done and the load weighs a ton, get a helper and a gold brick. Just gold brick. Just relax and avoid all the duties you hate. This life must agree, he looks better of late. Why I do believe that I'm putting on weight. Gold brick, dear gold brick, sweet gold brick. Hey, fellas, wait for baby. Just pretend that you're sick and your poor back is sore. Remember? Yeah. And a limp with a groan to that hospital door. Gold brick. I'm a gold brick. I'm a gold brick. Japan could win war. Gorbrick, honorable Gorbrick, honorable Gorbrick. 